Leaving Rapid City by Gary Ives. Read by Gary Ives. On the last day of school, Sandra Connor and Bridget Knutson were in the dark, tiny alcove that led down to the boiler room. They were kissing when two jocks, footballers, heading down to the boiler room for a smoke discovered them. Within an hour, it was all over the school, and someone had even scrawled Lesbo, large, with a black magic marker over Bridget's new tan Ford Ranger, her rancher father's graduation present. Sandy skipped graduation ceremonies and supposed that Bridget had as well, but did not know since Bridget had not returned to school and would not answer her phone. Although they had known and liked one another all during their last semester of high school, she and Bridget had only just realized a stronger mutual attraction the week before. Standing in the lunch line, Bridget had gently brushed against Sandy, then smiled in that way. The two had spent the last week of high school between final exams and senior assemblies apprehensive, cautiously probing one another for those cloaked signs of affection. At the graduation practice, Bridget had slipped a note into Sandy's hand. I want to kiss you. Sandy's heart raced as she whispered in Bridget's ear to meet her at the alcove. Now this. Sandy and her mother had moved back to Rapid City from Pierre at Christmas time. May, her mother, had received a letter from the South Dakota State Attorney General's office notifying her of Sandy's father's release date from the state penitentiary at Sioux Falls. Last place that son of a bitch will look for us is Rapid City. That's where he got busted and he knows them cops still got it in for his sorry ass. But let's play it safe, baby. If any of your friends ask, tell them we're moving back up to Billings. Billings, Sandy, you got that? You understand, don't you, baby? So she had entered Central High in Rapid City for her last semester of high school. How many public schools did that make? Nine? Ten? Yankton, Rapid City, Fargo, Billings, Pierre. Now back in Rapid City. Fuck. It had always been her dad running from the law, or running from some dealer he'd burned. Then she and her mom running from him until, at last, he'd drawn six years for breaking a cop's jaw and possession. Good riddance. The outing at Central High was the pits. Fortunate only in that it was at the very end of the senior year. Real feelings for Bridget had begun to grow with her yearning for something more, something undefined, desire of an unknown dimension. She was almost 18, a virgin. Friends talked incessantly of sex, but it wasn't sex that she wanted. It was love. It was joy. It was to quench that thirst for the enlightened characters in movies and novels, the things they found. A relationship, especially this kind? Was such passionate romance something perceived only through fiction, novels, and movies? Portrayals and unlikely to ever descend upon anyone in wind-blown, freezing, cold, shit old Rapid City? Rapid City, home to too many asshole cowboys and drunken Indians, misogynists, racists, and medieval views of women, education, and culture. And the women, hard scrabble beaten down by the vicissitudes of machismo, brutal winters, and living in a place where, for hundreds of miles, high culture was shit kicker bars, bowling alleys, and movie houses showing nothing but films with explosions and car chases. Before Bridget Knudsen, she had firmly resigned to escape the Dakotas ASAP after graduation. Now she'd even fantasize getting off the train with Bridget in Chicago or New York. The hurt from the outing was less from the shame engendered by gossip than from Bridget's retreat. Come on, girl, give me a call. Sandy's memory was, however, fraught with goodbyes and furtive nighttime skips out of town. 
Only two good friends had survived this nomadic existence. Billy Peltier and her Uncle Finn. Finn, her mother's younger, smarter brother, and a true bohemian, had a genuine love for his only niece, and when he was around he doted on her. Freshly discharged from the Navy, he had come to live for a while with his sister. Sandy had attached herself to her happy-go-lucky uncle, who had no problem allowing his 13-year-old niece to drive his Volkswagen, smoke cigarettes, and say shit, goddammit, and fuck it. Finn believed himself as a reincarnated Lakota Sioux shaman. He fascinated Sandy, recounting his visions through dreams. He once told her that he had dreamt of her. In his dream, Sandy was searching for her people, but beset by enemies. Wounded, she is saved by a sleek gray wolf, which she rode like a pony to a beautiful safe valley in the lodges of her people. Finn could always make her feel good. A paraplegic boy her age, Billy Peltier, and she had become close friends in Pierre. An outsider like Sandy, the two had met in the ninth grade when May had rented their trailer from Billy's grandmother, who lived next door. No father had ever claimed Billy, whose mother had fled to earn her fortune on her back up north in the oil fields, leaving the boy with his grandmother's supported by social security and meager rental from three shabby trailers on the sad side of town. Because she could beat him in arm wrestling when they were 14, he called her Grip. As soon as the queer gossip hit May's ears, she pitched a fit. God damn it, Sandy, what the hell's the matter with you, girl? Ain't boys good enough for you, huh? You got a munch carpet? Is that it? Where in God's name did that come from, I want to know. Your people may not be perfect by a long shot, but we ain't never had no queers or dykes. Never. Jesus H. Christ, girl, where do you think you are? Sandy, this ain't San Francisco or Paris, France. No, 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 this here is the hard side of Brokeback Mountain. You best straighten up and fly right, girl. She said nothing, but went into a brooding silence. She tried calling Bridget once again. She was tearing up later when she dialed Billy's number. Billy, I gotta get out of this shit hole. Would you please ask your grandma if I can stay with you for a while? Hey, what's the matter, Grip? You in trouble or something? Just go ask her right now, Billy. Let me explain when I get there. Hold on a minute, Grip. Yeah, Grandma said, why sure, honey. Get your ass down here out of whatever storm you're in, Grip. Okay, there's a morning greyhound to Sioux Falls in Vermilion. I'll get off at Vermilion and hitch a ride to Yankton. Fuck that, Grip. Find out what time the bus gets to Vermilion, and Grandma and me will be waiting. Billy's place would be temporary sanctuary only. She resolved to find the life she was supposed to live as far from the prairie. From her top dresser drawer, she took out the sock that held the $85, some of it babysitting money, some of it the $50 Uncle Finn had sent her for her 18th birthday. Finn was earning big money now, down in Nebraska, living in his camper, repairing combines all over the state. He'd lend her money. If he couldn't, well, somehow she'd find work, probably waiting tables in Sioux Falls. And when she had enough, she was heading for New York. From the kitchen, she heard May yell at her, I'm going to work now. You best think over what I'm telling you, Sandy. You don't straighten up your act, you're asking for big trouble. Big trouble, girl. This is Rabbit City. You hear me? Yes, ma'am. I hear you. And fuck you, too. I'll be so glad to be out of this shit heap. She dialed Bridget's number. This time she waited for the answering machine. Bridget, I reckon this is goodbye, hon. I wish... Oh, well, best of luck, girl. I'm leaving Rapid City for good on this early morning Greyhound. I do wish... Fuck it. Goodbye, girl. The next morning, with a small valise in hand, she quietly closed the front door as her mother snored from her bedroom. She walked the seven blocks to the Greyhound station, bought a large coffee, Waiting alone in an outside bench for the bus to announce boarding, she never heard 
his approach. A powerful left arm tightened into a chokehold as Randy Lamar, Mr. Knudsen's ranch foreman, cut off her right earlobe and then hanks of her hair with his buck knife. You don't never call Knudsen's number. You hear me, you little slut? Never. Got that? A minute later, she heard the klaxon on Lamar's pickup as he sped past, shooting her the bird. Looking down, she saw blood and hair all over her lap and the bench. Once aboard the Greyhound, she willed herself not to cry. I'm strong, damn it. I'm bigger than them, she thought. Fenn's dream was true. She was indeed strong, and she knew that wherever she'd land, be it Minneapolis, Chicago, or New York, there she would find the lodges of her people.